Hello and welcome to part two of this lesson on equilibrium and problem solving. In part one we looked at translational and rotational equilibrium and did problems numbers one and two. In part two we're going to look at four more problems. Very quickly problem three is about a plank carrying a weight and supported at two points. Problem four is about an object on a horizontal surface, it's being pulled and is about to start slipping. Problem five is about an object moving along an inclined plane. And problem six is about a plank resting against a wall. If there's a particular type of problem you want help with, you can look at the slide numbers on the right. And if you need to go to a particular problem, you can use that information and the slide numbering on the bottom right of the screen to help you find the problem you're most interested in. As always, a pen, paper and calculator will let you try the problems for yourself. So if you haven't got those, pause the video and go and get them. Before we start with the actual problems, I'll just mention a couple of things which will help you understand my method of working. First of all, how we're going to present force calculations. Well, I'm sure you already know that when we add forces, we have a sign convention, typically something like vertical forces, up is positive, down is negative, horizontal forces, right is positive, left is negative. So, bearing that in mind, here's a very simple problem, an object with three forces on it, A, B, C. We're told the object is in equilibrium. That means the resultant force on it is zero. So since A, B and C are vectors, we would write A plus B plus C equals, well, that's a resultant, which is zero. So that's the format we're going to use in the calculations later on. When dealing with forces, we're going to add the forces on the left side of the equation. And if the object is in translational equilibrium, the right hand side must be zero. So in this particular example here, suppose we know A is minus 50 newtons, minus because it acts to the left, B is unknown, and C is plus 100 newtons because it acts to the right. All we need to do is plug the values into our equation. A plus B plus C have got it equals zero because it's in equilibrium. A we replace by minus 50, B remains B, C replaced by 100, and that's our equation to solve. If you do that, B is minus 50 newtons, which simply means B is 50 newtons to the left. That's the format we're using. Similarly, when we do moment or torque calculations, we need a standard way of presenting it. So what I'm going to do is this. We won't be using a sign convention for moments. Some people do, some people like to call clockwise moments positive, for example, and so on, but we won't be using that. What we're gonna do is this. We're gonna say for objects in rotational equilibrium, we'll use the magnitudes of the forces when doing calculations, and the equation total clockwise moment equals total anti-clockwise moment. Really, it's a magnitude of the clockwise moment equals a magnitude of the anti-clockwise moment when something is in rotational equilibrium. And a very quick example will illustrate this. There's a plank balanced at its center of gravity on a pivot. Two forces which can cause rotation act, A on the left, 100 newtons on the right. We want to calculate A. Well, it's a trivial problem, so let me just do it for you. We'll work out the total clockwise moment and put it on the left side of the equation. Work out the total anti-clockwise moment, put it on the right side of the equation. We're not using a sign convention. We'll use the magnitudes of the forces and, the, and this equation. So, what's the total clockwise moment? Hope you can see. Take moments about the pivot. It's 100 times 3 clockwise. What's the total anti-clockwise moment? Right side of the equation is A, whatever A is, times four. So we get that simple equation, clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment because it's in rotational equilibrium. 
and that gives A 75 newtons. That's the magnitude of A. We use a bit of common sense to get the direction we say A acts downwards. OK, if you bear that all in mind, it will make the calculations we do next clearer to follow. Now the first problem is number 3. It follows from problem 2 in part 1 of the lesson. And this problem is, first of all, an exercise in comprehension, because I want you to read through the entire question first, and then answer part A. So your task is to pause the video, read the whole question, and answer part A. So pause the video now. Well, I hope you've had a go. Your diagram should look something like this. There is the plank. Its weight is 400 newtons, so that's on the diagram acting downwards through the center of gravity, which is the middle of the plank. It's a uniform plank. Mark the distance, one and a half, one and a half meters, for example, like that. Middle of the plank. The plank's on two supports. We don't draw the supports. A free body diagram shows the forces on an object. So each support provides an upwards force stopping the object going downwards. An upwards normal contact force. I'll call the one on the left N1, the one on the right N2. Could have called them A, B, or L and R, left and right. It really doesn't matter. And we mark the distance, 0.5 meters from each end. And then we've got a 200 Newton metal block on the plank. We don't draw the block, we draw the force. Because it's a free body diagram, we show only the object and the forces acting. So 200 Newtons is shown, and we mark the position as 1.2 meters from the left end. And that's the basic diagram we're going to work with. Your diagram should look something like that. It certainly should have all four forces in the right directions and the distances. The next part for you to try is to answer part B. So pause the video and see if you can answer part B of this question. Right, let's go through it. We'll start by drawing the diagram and leave some space underneath to put the working. We're going to start by resolving vertically. That means analyzing the vertical forces. We know the plank is in equilibrium, so the forces add up to zero, and they're all vertical, up or down. So we can say resolving vertically, we're going to add all the forces on the left and say they equal zero. So N1 and N2 plus, well, 200 Newtons is a downwards force, so we're going to add minus 200. And 400 is a downwards force, so we're going to add minus 400. That gives us N1 and N2 add up to 600. Now we've got two unknowns, N1 and N2, so we need another equation, a second equation, two equations for two unknowns. The second equation we get by taking moments. Now there's different points we can take moments about, but it's easiest if we take moments about N1's point of application here, or N2's point of application here. We can use other points, but it makes the equation more complicated. For example, by taking moments about N1's point of application, there's only one unknown in the equation we get, and that is N2. So watch how I do this step very carefully. I've picked my point here about which to take moments. So taking moments about N1's point of application, we'll do clockwise moments on the left equals anti-clockwise moments on the right. So let's do the clockwise moments. Well, the first force to produce a clockwise moment is this 200 one, working left to right. What is the moment produced by this force? Draw the line of action. Work out how far the line of action is from the point where we're taking moments. It's this distance. I've marked it with a white arrow. It's 0.7 meters. How do I know it's 0.7? Well, this distance is 1.2, and I need to subtract half a meter, 0.5, to leave 0.7. So 
So a clear diagram with the distances marked makes it much easier to do this sort of problem. So the clockwise moment of the 200 Newton force is 200 times 0.7. Any other clockwise forces to add? Uh, clockwise moments to add? Yes, 400 Newtons also produces a clockwise moment about this point. So, let's get rid of that. 400 Newtons, line of action here. How far is this distance? It's one meter. How do I know? It's one and a half minus this bit, which is a half, leaving one meter. So the clockwise moment to add on is 400 times 1.0. There are no more clockwise moments, so this expression must equal the anti-clockwise moment. What's that? Well, it's the moment produced by N2. So N2's line of action is here. How far is it from the point? It's two meters. How do we know that? Well, it's three meters minus the two bits at the end, half a meter each. Two meters. So the clockwise moments equals the anti-clockwise moment. Force is N2 times two meters. That's a bit of arithmetic, very simple. We get 540 is 2N2, so N2 is 270 Newtons. The rest is easy. N1 is simply 600 minus N2. So N1 is 600 minus 270, it's 330 Newtons. And those are the two contact forces, the two forces which support the plank at the ends. That's a very common sort of problem, so if you didn't follow it, pause the video, work through it carefully, and make sure you understand each step. Okay, can I remind you, this is a long and fairly intense video, a lot of detail, so if you need to pause the video and just have a break, a cup of tea or something, feel free. Let's go on to the next problem. This one I'll read for you. A five kilogram box is on a horizontal floor. A rope pulls as shown at 20 degrees to the horizontal. That's a red arrow. When the tension in the rope is 25 newtons, the box is just about to start sliding along the floor. So it's not sliding, but if I pulled with just a bit more than 25 newtons, the box would start sliding to the right. So we know we're in a condition of limiting friction. And the questions are, what is the frictional force on the box? And find the coefficient of static friction between the floor and the box. Value for G, 9.8 meters per second squared. So what I'd like you to do is, in a moment, pause the video, read it through yourself. Start by drawing a free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the box, and then see if you can answer the questions. OK, pause and have a go now. Well, I hope you've tried it. Let's go through it. I've put the question in slightly smaller characters just at the top. There's box. We know one of the forces is 25 newtons. Another force is the weight of the box. Weight is mg, mass times acceleration due to gravity. 5 times 9.8 is 49 newtons. Any other forces? Well, the normal force of the floor on the box, the ground on the box, is upwards, vertically upwards. I'll call that n. Now, in simple problems, n often equals the weight. But in this problem, n, the normal force, is not equal to the weight because of the upwards component of this tension. We don't know what the normal force is. We'll call it N. Any other forces? Well, the thing is on the point of sliding, so there is limiting frictional force on the base to the left. Call it F. Now, those are the four forces acting on the box, and it's very important to be able to identify them and express them on the diagram, such as one we've got here. When we've done that, the rest is relatively easy. So let's look at the question. What is the frictional force? Well, you note the frictional force here is acting horizontally. Let's resolve horizontally. The thing is in equilibrium, so in a horizontal direction, the forces add up to zero. There's no resultant. So resolving horizontally, 
What are the forces? Well, there's two. There's a component of the tension, that's 25 cos 20, pulling to the right, and there's a frictional force acting to the left. N and W have no horizontal component, so we don't worry about them in the horizontal direction. So we can say 25 cos 20, horizontal component of tension, plus the frictional force F adds up to zero. Do the arithmetic and you get F is minus 23.5 newtons. And the minus just means it acts to the left. That's the sign convention. So in answer to part A, what's the frictional force on the box? We could say the frictional force is 23.5 newtons to the left. Now, we need to find the coefficient of static friction. And if you remember about friction, you'll know we need not only the frictional force, the limiting frictional force, we need the normal force too. So we need to find N. Let's resolve vertically. Now, in a vertical direction, what have we got? Upwards, we've got N itself. Part of the tension in the rope is upwards, 25 sine 20 if you know how to resolve components, which is a separate lesson, you'll know the vertical component is 25 sine 20. And downwards we've got 49, the weight. So let's write an equation for the forces in a vertical direction. We've got n upwards, we've got 25 sine 20 upwards, and we've got 49 downwards, so we add minus 49. Because we know the value and it's notes downwards we put a minus sign in. They add up to zero. There is no resultant force in a vertical direction. Then it's a case of using the calculator, n comes to 40.4 newtons. Now, I hope you remember static friction, coefficient of static friction, mu subscript s. The standard formula is the limiting frictional force, that's the frictional force on the point of slipping, divided by the normal force. Now, we don't care what direction the force of friction is to the left or right. Really, this equation could be written as the coefficient is the magnitude of the frictional force over the magnitude of the normal force. All we do is put the values in, 23.5 over 40.4. Gives a 0.58, and that's the answer, the coefficient of static friction. Hope that made sense. Let's move on to the next problem, number five. Okay, this is rather similar to problem four, but I've just tilted everything. I'll read it for you as a special favour. A 5 kilogram box pulled at a steady speed in a straight line up a slope inclined at 15 degrees to the horizontal. That's the diagram. The rope, that's shown by the red arrow, is inclined at 20 degrees to the slope. And the rope has a tension of 25 newtons. So that is the rope pulling the box upwards and that rope makes an angle of 20 degrees, not to the horizontal, but to the slope. And you've got to work out, first of all, what the frictional force is on the box and what the coefficient of kinetic friction is. Now, before you start, I'm going to remind you of something which you ought to know already if you've covered resolving vectors into components, but let me remind you. If you put an object on a slope, on an incline, the object has its weight acting vertically downwards, called the weight W. There may be other forces as well, I don't care about those at the moment, I'm just showing you a useful trick. The weight acts vertically downwards. Now, it's often useful to split that weight into two components, and I've done it here. One component, A, is parallel to the slope, and acts downhill. The other component, I've called B, is perpendicular to the slope, acting into the slope. So instead of thinking about the force W, we can pretend there are two separate forces, A and B. How do we calculate what A and B are? Well, A is W sine theta, B is W cos theta. 
That's covered in the lesson on resolving vectors into components. Now bear that in mind. Let's go back to our original question. I'd like you to pause the video, read through the question and have a go now. So pause now. Well, let's hope you've tried it. The first thing I hope you realise, just like the previous problems, is to identify all the forces which act on that box and draw a diagram. So there's a box with the 25 Newton force shown. What other forces do we want to add? The normal force is the force stopping the box sinking into the plane. It's perpendicular to the slope, called it N. The weight of the box, of course, acts vertically downwards. We know that is mg, 5 times 9.8, it's 49 newtons. And the box is being pulled upwards, so kinetic friction is acting. There's a frictional force acting parallel to the slope downhill, call that F. Those are the forces acting on the box as it moves. Now, we're told it, it's moving at a steady speed in a straight line. So that tells us straight away the velocity is constant. That means the resultant force is zero. It's not accelerating. So this is in equilibrium. It's not accelerating. What we're going to do is not use horizontal and vertical when we resolve our forces. We're going to work in a direction parallel to the inclined plane and perpendicular to the inclined plane. That should be clear in a moment. So, so let's start. Let's resolve. Let's analyze the forces parallel to the plane. Well, what forces have we got? There are several. F obviously acts parallel to the plane. It's acting downwards. We expect it to turn up with a negative value. 25 newtons, that's tension, a component of that acts parallel to the plane and uphill. It's 25 cos 20. N has no component parallel to the plane because it's perpendicular to the plane. But W has. Remember what we said earlier about A and B splitting W into components A and B. Part of W is a force parallel to the plane downhill. Do you remember what that was? Let's write our equation down. There's the equation. Uphill, we've got 25 cos 20. We've got F to add in, which will turn out to be a negative value. And we've got downhill, because it's the component of weight, it acts downhill, is 49, the weight times sine of this angle. 49 sine 15 is the component of weight acting parallel to the plane downhill. Now all we have to do is get our calculator out and F works out to be minus 10.8 newtons. Negative because it's downhill. We've decided to call downhill negative. Uphill positive. So We've resolved parallel to the plane and worked out the frictional force. That was actually the first part of the question. What is the frictional force? It's actually the force of kinetic friction. It's 10.8 newtons downhill, parallel to the plane. Let's keep going. Let's resolve now perpendicular to the plane. What forces have we got? Well, F won't make any difference because it's at 90 degrees to the direction we're interested in. N is perpendicular to the plane. A component of 25 is perpendicular to the plane, parallel to N. And a component of the weight is perpendicular to the plane into the paper, into the, into the plane rather, excuse me. That was B when we talked about resolving the weight into components. Let's just write the equation down. So we've got N We've got 25 sine 20. That's a component of this tension, which is acting perpendicular to the plane in the same direction as n. So that's 25 sine 20. But then in the opposite direction, into the plane, we've got component we called b in the previous slides. And that was minus, because it's the opposite direction, 49 cos 15. b 
is 49 cos 15 it's acting into the plane I've decided to call that negative so I'm adding minus 49 cos 15 and those forces act on the box in a vertical in a, in a direction perpendicular to the plane so there's no resultant in that direction there's no acceleration in that direction they add up to give zero calculator gives n is 38.80 newtons the coefficient of friction coefficient of kinetic friction mu subscript k is simply the kinetic frictional force over the normal force 10.8 we can ignore the minus sign we only want the magnitude 10.8 over 38.8 0.28. Quite a tricky question actually. You can have a pause if you want before we go into the final question. So for the final one we've got a 5 meter long plank weighing 300 newtons it's resting against a smooth that means frictionless wall so a wall with negligible friction that's up here. The plank slips if the angle between it and the floor is less than 65 degrees. So there's friction between the plank and the floor. If you move the plank so it's more upright, the plank won't slip. The angle will be more than 65 degrees. But if you move the bottom of the plank outwards so the angle is less than 65 degrees, in fact there isn't enough friction, the ladder will slip and slide downwards and outwards. So at this angle, limiting friction must be acting at the base of the ladder. It's limiting frictional force just holding it. You've got to work out what that coefficient of friction is, coefficient of static friction is between the plank and the floor. So I'm going to ask you to pause, read through. You probably want to draw a diagram, mark all the forces, and see if you can work out the coefficient of friction. Pause now if you haven't. Let's go through this. What forces act? I'll do this fairly quickly. Weight 300 newtons down, downwards through the middle. At the base of the ladder, the ground, the floor, will provide a normal contact force which is vertically upward. I've called it V for vertical to distinguish it from this force which is the horizontal force normal force of the wall on the top of the ladder. So we've got things resting against flat surfaces there is a normal force outwards from the flat surface. Called it V for the normal force from the floor and H the normal force from the wall. In addition we've got friction at the bottom of call that F. In this problem it's limiting friction when angle is 65 degrees. That's stopping the ladder sliding outwards and becoming unstable. Just enough to stop it sliding. Those are our forces. Now, I've drawn the ladder though it's 5 meters long. One of those forces is this normal force of the wall on the top of the ladder, H horizontal. I'm going to need in a minute to work out the moment of H about the base of the ladder. So I'm just going to show you how to do it now. It makes the, the working less cluttered. How do we get the moment of H about the bottom of the ladder? Well, there's the line of action of H. We need this distance with some simple trigonometry, just like resolving a vector. We can show that this length is 5 times the sine of 65. You can verify for that for yourself. That means the moment of h about the bottom of the plank is the size of h times that distance. So it's h times 5 sine 65 degrees. And it's a clockwise moment. Now we're also going to need the moment that the weight of the ladder produces about the bottom of the ladder. So I should say plank very often these questions are asked about ladders, but um, I'm using ladder and plank interchangeably here. So if we think about the weight, it's 300 newtons from the middle of the ladder downwards. Two and a half meters from each end is the center of gravity. We want the moment of this weight about the bottom. 
and we need this distance and I hope you can see it is 2.5 times the cosine of 65 degrees it means that the moment of weight about the bottom of the plank is 300 newtons times that distance 300 times 2.5 cos 65 and it's an anti-clockwise moment now we'll be using both of these results in a moment so there's our diagram drawn multicolored showing all the forces let's start by resolving first of all vertically well H and F have no vertical components so the vertical forces are simply the 300 and the V and they've got to add up to zero because there's no resultant so V plus well 300 is a negative force it's downwards so V plus minus 300 equals zero so V is 300 newtons it's the same magnitude as the weight fairly obviously resolving horizontally well the 300 newton weight and V make no difference they're perpendicular to the horizontal direction so we've got two horizontal forces H and F so H and F have got to add up to zero so the zero resultant so F is simply minus whatever H is now let's take moments about the foot of the plank about this point now we did that in a previous slide to simplify the working here let me give you the results the clockwise moment is produced by H and it's H times the distance we worked out H times 5 sine 65 degrees and that must equal the anti-clockwise moment which is W the weight 300 times that distance so it's 300 times 2.5 cos 65 degrees there should be a degree symbol there the forces V and F act through this point therefore have zero moments when we do the arithmetic we get on the left 5.53 H is 317 so H is 57.3 Newtons the frictional force F is minus H so F is minus 57.3 Newtons we've worked out the limiting frictional force we want the coefficient of static friction that is the limiting frictional force over the normal reaction we can ignore the minus sign so we know F is 57.3 the normal reaction N is what we've called V so we divide F by the value of V which we know is 300 so it's 57.3 over 300 0.19 quite low actually it must be quite a slippery floor okay a tricky problem if you're not used to them well that's all there's quite a lot to absorb there thank you for watching I hope it helped